Before we hear God's word, let us pray the collect together, asking God to help our listening and our receiving. Let us pray the collect. O oh God, light of the minds that know you, life of the souls that love you, strength of the thoughts that seek you, help us so to know you that we may truly love you, so to love you that we may fully serve you, whose service is perfect freedom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The reading today, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 through 18, is from one of Paul's letters to the Corinthian, the church in Corinth. The church there was struggling with differing factions. In Paul's eyes, it had some false and boastful ideas about what Christian life is about. Paul's words, which we are about to hear, must have sounded pretty radical to that congregation. Listen for God's word. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life is in you. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with scripture, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. Here ends the lesson. May God add his blessing to this reading. It's okay, admit it. You like to watch Antiques Roadshow, mostly to see the antique bringers' reactions. Will their faces light up? Will they say something like, wow, I had no idea? Or will they look a little crestfallen in the end? The expert appraiser says, this vase is from so-and-so's workshop in the mid-such-and-such -such century. It, it's actually quite rare. See, it has a remarkable border here and, and some unusual glazing. It isn't pristine, of course. It, it has a chip here, and there's a crack starting there. And the color is faded, all of which decrease its value. 
And the fair market price of this object would be Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthians, spends a lot of ink on claiming authenticity for himself and his fellow apostles. And he does it in a pretty strange way. Paul describes himself as something like a flawed antique. And in the end, he says, that's a good thing for the purpose of God's gospel. But it starts out as a problem for the new Christians in Corinth. They have some elevated, culturally based notions about how someone with this new knowledge from God ought to, ought to look and to speak and to act. And Paul just doesn't meet the description. Was he stooped over from his times of beating and imprisonment? Was he bearing scars? Did he stutter? Was he especially short? Did he have bad eyesight? Paul never lets us know for sure in his letters, but more than once he lets us know that he was a very flawed and imperfect vessel on his long, grueling roadshow for Christ. And this was hard for those Corinthians who believed that God's spirit promised in Jesus would give someone superlative wisdom and speech and exceptional wonder-working powers and we might imagine at least impressive physique. He'd be a first century winner, not a loser. So this excerpt from his letter this morning was a shocking self-example for Paul to set before these Corinthian critics, but it was an important truth for them to hear. We're not about touting ourselves, he says, we're about proclaiming Jesus Christ. We're here with you to shine forth the light of the gospel. But this treasure of God's love is stuffed inside these very unimpressive containers you see. And you know why? This makes it all the more clear that it's God who's the giver of these gifts, not our human selves. Yes, Paul says, we're like humble clay jars not silver chalices, but God's is the power. So we're afflicted, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Whew. What a catalog of chips and cracks. It's a good thing that Paul wasn't writing his page for Match.com. <laughs> and then the most gripping claim of all, maybe, the core, something that every church of human beings ever since has had to struggle with or should, Paul says, we're always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. In other words, what you are seeing, what we are apostles are sharing, Paul writes, is that the loving death of Jesus has led to new life for us and new life for you. The treasure, the light comes not from our mortal power, but from God, the God who loved us in Jesus and raised him to live with us and us to live with him. And this perfectly loving gift must be from God, not from us, because look at what a human mess we are. And this, you see, you Corinthians, is our certificate of authenticity as apostles. It's why we're always being renewed in our hope, why we're able to share the gospel through these imperfections, these chips and cracks. Well, oh my, we're never let in on just what sort of impression this made on the Corinthians with their lofty values and their squabbling. Though we do know for sure that there were faithful believers in that church. But we can allow Paul's words to lift us up as the very human creatures that we know ourselves to be. Well, this clay pot 
doesn't look like much of anything special. You see, it only has room to hold so much. There's a chip here. Well, no, actually, there are quite a few chips here. And it's partly cracked. The outside color is nice, but one tint is just as good as all the others. And yet it's also one of a kind. Its value comes from knowing who created it and, and from having this material on the inside that you can see gleaming through these chips and cracks. Its market value, priceless. If that would be Paul's message to us today, a reflection of the value that he and we have in God's eyes, it really goes against our cultural values, doesn't it? We have a president who brags that he likes winners, not losers. Our society increasingly sets one group over against another, usually the more powerful, disparaging the less, the vulnerable, the different. And we're daily led to worship the bodily beautiful, the asset wealthy, to believe that we can be securely loved and happy only through strength and success. On screens of all kinds, we're fascinated by fantasy characters with superpowers. All the time, knowing that all of this is fantasy. We are all of us mortal beings. We age. Our bodies change. We have badly limited knowledge and even less understanding. We think and do things that we and others regret, and we will die. I'm sure this is why Paul's words are so often precious to us. One day, Curtis and his little brother Barry are talking. Do you know the comic strip Curtis? Well, this one's a mostly one-way conversation in which Curtis, who is enamored of superheroes, says to Barry, would you like to have super speed so you could outrun bullets or super strong skin that couldn't be pierced by a poison dart or an ice pick or supervision to see through walls and junk so you could see if anyone's waiting to pop you upside the head with a brick? Maybe the ability to create a force field in case someone dropped a bomb on you. Or the ability to transport from one room to another may come in handy just in case someone rips a hole in the space-time continuum with a planet-smashing nuclear proton dispersion cannon missile. <laughs> and Curtis finally seems to have run out of breath. And little Barry looks up and says, I like the ability to make people get along. Hmm. There's a sermon in a comic strip. I hardly need to say more, but I will. Uh, the, the only real and lasting power that we're capable of having is the power of love. That love originates in God, has come among our flesh in Jesus, and that can be carried in these imperfect selves. And for whatever astonishing reason, God seems to have entrusted the message of reconciling love to the church, a collection of seriously flawed human beings who have the audacity to believe that God loves us, that God accepts our awkward efforts to worship, that God through Christ has poured into us gifts deeply needed by the world around us. We are very far from having superpowers. That's certainly underlined by the decline in the size and influence of the church today. And the church is even capable of terrible wrongdoing, as we've seen in this past week's news. The horrible abuse of children by those who have misused their authority in the church is a complete denial of the love of Christ. And in many other much more mundane ways, we know the church to be a menial container for this precious message, this gift of God, this gospel of love. But in every age, apostles call us to rediscover this gift and to renew our calling. This church, the Federated Church of Orleans, is about to begin a journey in which it will learn 
much about who it is. When a pastor leaves and the interim time unfolds, a church finds out about itself in important ways. Underlying problems can come to the surface. There can be unexpected confusion about the direction the church should go. Members who were looked to as leaders might fade into the background and faithful new servants may emerge. An interim church can discover old and new strengths, can see new opportunities for ministry and move toward them. Most of all, it can find renewed trust that God loves this imperfect container, this group of flawed humans who gather here and disperse into the world. Paul, I'm sure, would want us to believe this, to believe that God and to God, this humble clay pot, this church is truly priceless. But he would stress that not only are we loved in our imperfections, but this treasure of love is given to us that it might shine out to the world. No, not because we are all powerful or winners or superior pillars of morality, but because we are humble enough in our self-understanding to allow the gift of grace and love to be active in our life in the world. And so it has been with all those that we've learned to admire in our faith, from Dietrich Bonhoeffer to Martin Luther King to Dorothy Day to Desmond Tutu to Mother Teresa and the hundreds of unknown everyday saints that you and I could name who have influenced our lives. Julian of Norwich, the 14th century Christian mystic says, the soul is highest, noblest, worthiest, when it is lowest, humblest, and gentlest. In some of Paul's other writing, he speaks of the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, and peace, patience, <coughs> kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, were these ever more needed in the world than now? The writer of one commentary on today's passage says, perhaps we should be making every effort to get out of the Spirit's way and let these fruits show through from our inner selves to those around us. Or, as someone better known in popular philosophy, Leonard Cohen is known for singing Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Ah, yes, we say as the Church of Jesus Christ. But that's also where the light shines out. Amen. <laughs>